What's going on everybody, it's Jamie and welcome to the channel Thrift on Fire. This week we're gonna get back into the Let's Talk About Reselling in Canada series. Uh, we're gonna go back to Vancouver and talk to our friends from Storage Warriors. Uh, Jess is gonna be here today and we're gonna talk about you know some reselling, we're gonna talk about her YouTube channel, uh, we're gonna link down below her podcast, all of her socials, all that good stuff. Make sure to check her out, give her a like and a subscribe here on YouTube as well and let's get into it. I'm gonna, um... Some water. <laughs> oh yeah, water. I've got oh. water. <laughs> hey, there you go. Smart. Okay, so um, so we're here with Jessica. She is Storage Wars on YouTube, and I believe a podcast. Right? Is your podcast actually on um, Spotify or different platforms too? I think it is, at least on another platform, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. If you just go to business, it's called the Business of Reselling, and at businessofreselling.com, there's just a link there for any podcatcher that you might use, but. It's also on YouTube. Uh, it's at Storage Warrior Podcast. Okay, yeah. I think I remember. So I know you just recently reached out and we kind of chatted on Instagram, but I think maybe you reached out to me one time prior in an email. Was that right? Um, I'm a bit of a uh, comment lurker, so I might have oh, maybe it was dropped a, comment. a few yeah. comments on uh, some of your previous shows. Yeah, because I know when we started chatting, I'm like, why does this seem familiar? And it was probably from a comment. And I went back and kind of, you know, did the same. I sort of looked, looked through your content and watched a bit and and got familiar with with uh, with that and it's it's pretty interesting it's certainly a lot different than than what i do uh but that's you know why don't we just kind of explain what you do and, and what you're all about well uh, me and my husband run the business storage warrior out here in vancouver and we started it about i guess it's been almost 12 years now and we just got started because we liked the show storage wars 20 to 20 going twice gotta go guess what now dead man walking fair warning tonight it's not like yeah. you wait here you got it for two tans and we wondered if they did auctions in Vancouver. At the time, they did, and we found one. And we went to the auction. We bought the last locker of the day for like $200. Um, we turned it into $1,200 or so, and we were like, this is easy. Let's, <laughs> let's be resellers. Um, and so our, our kind of obsession or passion with it has just come from the whole idea of like just there's so much abandoned stuff there's so much stuff that people give away get rid of or just trash that's that's not just perfectly good but actually really desirable and that's kind of the thing that's been driving us these last 12 years to keep growing and scaling our business and rescuing things from the landfill and getting it into the hands of people who who love it so we did storage auctions for several years um stopped doing that for a number of reasons that i can talk about if you're interested um yeah. and now we do a lot of estate clear outs and and things like that to get most of our inventory or we buy collections from people who are downsizing and and that kind of thing and we just hustling every day trying to grow the business as big as we can yeah and that's kind of the so the the idea of what i think i was looking at so you guys actually have a, a company that sets up to do like clear outs is that right so in Canada, there's actually not very many companies that actually do estate sales the way they do in the United States. It doesn't seem to be culturally something that we're so into. I mean, in a few places you have it, um, but definitely not here in the lower mainland. So um, what we do is we basically go into a house that needs to be emptied out. And usually that reason that they need it emptied is because they want to sell it. And, you know, maybe somebody has passed away and now the house has been inherited, but it's full of stuff and the family doesn't want the stuff and they don't know what to do with it. Um, so that's where we kind of come in. So we're not working the way that junk haulers do. We're not coming in and just like throwing everything in the trash. So our type of client is the type of person who says, maybe there's good stuff in here and maybe there isn't. Um, but I just want it to be dealt with respectfully and responsibly. So we're pulling things out that we can resell. And we, as a result, we can clear out the house for a lot cheaper than a junk hauler would charge because we're making a, a money on the back end with the stuff that we're selling. And then we properly clear out the house, trash things that are actually trash, recycle, donate, and do everything we can to keep things out of the landfill. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah, that's kind of what I got from when I was just sort of checking out what you're doing. And that seems like, it seems pretty daunting. Like that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> it's so much work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Um, we so have a we have a house going right now that's two stories, three bedrooms. Um, I wouldn't call it a hoarder situation, but it's very cluttered, and uh, yeah, and but it's got artwork and antique lamps and I don't know sterling silver and really cool old furniture in it, and so it's just a matter of like you have to sift through all of that and just keep going back and and make a make a goal for that day. Like here's my objective is going to be this room, or my objective is going to be all getting rid of just trash or whatever it is, and that 
helps keep it from getting overwhelming. And what do you think your your main source of not source, but what do you really use for selling platforms? I'm sure you know, like local with some of the bigger stuff. But are you like a, on eBay and Etsy and and there's the typical things? eBay is our main selling platform. I'm not a big fan of cross listing. I I get the argument that it gets your more eyes on your stuff, um, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, time is better spent just focusing on the platform that works best for you and making it as great as possible. So we focus mostly on eBay and we do sell uh, larger items locally. Uh, I don't enjoy that, <laughs> that aspect of it. In fact, on my YouTube channel, I have a whole rant about why I hate selling on Facebook Marketplace. Go check it out. But uh, <laughs> but it's it becomes a little bit of a necessary evil when you have good stuff that's not practical to ship, um, that we have to use some of those local platforms to sell. And we once in a while will do online auctions as well, which we've gotten away from over the past year. But we're thinking about we have a new sourcing opportunity that's keeping us in a lot of inventory. So we may have to revisit the auction just to move stuff more quickly. Sure. And I'm sure a big part of you not wanting to cross list is I don't think you have it. And if you're getting a house full of stuff, you don't have an issue with inventory. Right. So like my biggest issue, and I think a lot of people's biggest issue, maybe in my area is like uh, thrift stores are available to me right now, but there are no garage sales. Estate sales are kind of slim in this area. I don't find a lot of them. So unless you're going to auctions or really hitting up like, like uh, storage units and stuff like that, I have a hard time finding enough things to list five things every day or five quality things. So I'm, I'm sure you don't have an issue with finding things to list. It's probably discarding, you know, what you don't want to list. Right. So, so for me, I think cross listing is valuable because it gives me the opportunity to sell the same thing across different platforms, but I'm sure you don't have an, an inventory problem with the way you're sourcing. We had a lot, an inventory problem for a long time, which I think I finally solved. Um, we've always been bulk buyers and volume buyers, so we're very interested in that volume game. We have yeah. a, about 7,000 listings on eBay, so we really do keep our store pretty sizable, and we're always trying to get that to 10. Problem is we keep selling stuff. Yeah. Okay. That's how it's and supposed to work. <laughs> how, how is, when you're, when you're dealing in that volume, how is your feedback score? Is it still very good? Because I know it seems like the more you sell, the harder it is to keep that rating in, in a, you know, it's probably still on a respectable level, but it's hard to keep it around that 99, 100 area when you're moving large volume. Yeah, it's 99.8, which is great. Uh, I'm super happy with that. Um, I actually just did a video telling people not to stress about feedback. It's not something that bothers me in the least because we are just, we're focusing on creating a business that has, you know, really nice inventory that people want. We ship really quickly, you know, we're thinking about our buyers and what they're looking for. And as long as you're serving that to them, you know, there'll be one in a thousand people or so, or maybe a little bit more who are upset for reasons you just can't control. Yeah. And there's no reason to fret about it. Just do your best. Keep trying to improve your business and move on. Yeah. I, I know when I had to eat my first negative feedback that stick, it's really stuck. It was, it was crushing. And, and now it just rolls off my, off my shoulder. If, if you, Pretty much get to the point where you know you haven't done anything anything really wrong and like why would you as, as a business owner if you're a respectful business owner you're probably going to try to do everything you can there are just some unreasonable people out there um, but i do remember having a conversation with the ebay rep that uh i'm like it seems crazy because you know now that i've accepted that i know that i'm going to accept a negative feedback now i know everyone that comes to me after this is going to be much more easier to accept. So I'm not going to fight so hard for it. <laughs> so I just, I think the eBay feedback, the way it's set up is so primitive. It just seems like not even that valuable anymore, to be honest. I think it should be abolished. Yeah. Or at least it's not a popular be. opinion, but that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it should be updated in, in, a, in a different way. That's maybe more modernized or maybe tells a more clear story. But uh, yeah, just interesting. I, I was just mm -hmm. sort of thinking that when you're talking about the volume, I'm like, with that much volume, there has to be, you know, that much more pushback on, because there are always, always like negative people out there for sure. And it happens, it happens too, when you're processing items as quickly as we do, that sometimes we screw up. Yeah. I mean, it, we're human beings. My, I might make an error. One of my listing people might make an error and that, you know, every once in a while I get a complaint and I'm like, ah, I deserve that. Sorry. Right. And I just work on my process. Like what, what was the process that was faulty that led to that error and try to correct it that way. Right. You did mention something that just made my brain go uh, light up. Yeah. Listing people. So you have employees, right? So this isn't just a two man operation or a man and a woman, <laughs> not two man, but you know what I mean? Um, people yeah. call me man all the time. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, you, you have to be careful what you say these days, regardless. <laughs> regarding, regardless. But um, yeah, so how many? So you have a few employees. Whether I don't know if they're physical or virtual assistant type things, or so how how uh, in depth do you want to get about that? Oh, I'm happy to share. I'm, I'm pretty transparent about our business. I mean, my podcast is all about like how we're trying to scale. So I'm, mm -hmm. I like to tell people uh, what we're doing right and what, where we screw up. Um, we have uh, one. We have a seasonal employee who's um, physically in our in our warehouse who works like part of the spring and all summer and when he's not um, doing school. And then we have two listers who are remote. Um, they're somewhere in the prairies, I always forget where, and they do um, they do a lot of our listings. So any items that we have in bulk, like comic books, cassette tapes, vinyl records, if we do a big batch of those, I send them off to, to them and they do the listing. And we are currently hiring a new person for our warehouse because the photography um, has just become too much for us to handle and we, we really need to get another person in physically to do that. So. Yeah, hopefully by the end of next week, we're up to five. Wow. So that's what you're, you're just doing your photography and then sending it with do you do like give um, basic notes on your items. Or you just leave it up to them to realize what it is and just do the research. I'm a big systems person. So I've designed documentation that explains here's how you do comic books and here are the things you need to look up. So um, I kind of I give them the basic details and the photos are things that won't be so obvious in photos when it comes to like damage and things like that. Yeah. And then I've given them a process for like, these are the types of keywords they need to go in the listing title. Here's a minimal amount of research that you need to do to make this a strong listing. They know that and they can run with it. So I know we kind of touched on, you said what kind of got you started in reselling was just your love for storage boards, the television show. Was there like a necessity for wanting to be self-employed or were you self-employed prior to that? Or what really made the leap of wanting to do this as your full-time job, just not a hobby? Sure. Um, my husband and I are both people who uh, don't do well with bosses. I mean, we've, we've both always kind of leaned towards a little bit of a hustle mindset, kind of figuring it out for ourselves and how to make money. Um, so transitioning into this felt easy and felt like the right thing to do from from that perspective. I mean, he had a very physical job for 20 years. His body was starting to break down. It just didn't make sense to keep doing it. I was self-employed um, mostly for a few years as a business consultant, a startup consultant. And I was also teaching part-time at uh, the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver. And in the end, the business was, you know, it, it was more fun for the both of us and it made more money than anything else we had ever done. So taking the, the leap of just walking away from employment was exactly the right thing for both of us yeah it, it is tricky though i know i'm um i'm just speaking currently with uh, a couple on instagram who's not pretty local to me uh they're in burlington and they wanted they asked if they they could sit down with me um and talk about what it means to like kind of go full-time and what the expectations it's tough uh, did you have a tough time when you when you started trying to figure out you know um, I'm sure if you have a business background, you kind of understood like, you know, how to, how to set money aside and do all those things, but it's not like having a regular job. There's a lot of influx in income and then there's dips when you have slower times. Did you find that transition pretty hard to like to get through or did you just kind of hit the ground running and just never looked back? Um, yeah, I'm somebody who functions pretty well with my back against the wall. So I just kind of leap in, which is not something I necessarily recommend for everybody. I think, um, you know, we were fortunate to be in a position where we had started doing this as a side hustle and built up as pretty significant savings just from that because we were both doing other jobs. And so by the time we were both in it full time, you know, we had that kind of buffer, which I always recommend for people like at least three months or six months of what you need to live on. Just have that banked before you dive all the way in um, because you're going to make mistakes. You have to figure out cash flow and those things can be really stressful. And you also have to figure out if entrepreneurship is really for you. So give yourself the money that buys you the time to be able to do that. Um, I have an MBA yeah, and a business background, top business for a lot of years. So I really enjoy taking kind of those traditional business problems and applying them to reselling because it's not something that you see a lot of. It's not like you can pick up a book on it like, on how to be a reseller, even though there's a lot of information out there. It's yeah. it's not quite the same as like buying a book on a restaurant startup or something like that. Yeah, for sure. And there's so many different routes you can take with reselling, I, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but I, I do think you did hit a good point there is building yourself a little nest egg before you even consider uh, that. That's definitely something I did. I took, I think, 
uh, before I decided to go full time, I think I took about a year's worth of what I was making reselling and just stashed it away. Um, now, in my situation, I don't I don't know if you fo followed recently on our ch on the channel here, but uh, you know I took a big portion of that nest egg that I put for savings for myself and kind of pushed it all in on on the business uh, a, a spa with my wife. But I mean that was a way smarter invest investment. We could see like a past track record and we could see the books. So I mean that's my money's still sitting there, but now I'm sort of I'm sort of sitting there in a situation where I don't have so much in savings because I'm all in on that. So it is a little scary. Um, and I'm noticing at the beginning of the year with, you know, sales up and down, it, it's definitely something you want to make sure that you have savings or some sort of uh, something to rely on for sure. Yeah. And especially, de you know, depending where you live, we live in Vancouver. It's one of the most expensive cities in the world. We're right in the middle of yeah. the city too. We're not in the suburbs. So it's like, yeah, it's uh, the the cash outflow is pretty significant every month, and you really have to make sure that you've got a system in place to just keep money coming in all the time. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And what what else about Vancouver do you find like? If we're going to talk about pros and cons about where you live in Canada, uh, what do you think are the greatest? I would think if I was just thinking about it, I would think there's a lot of um, money or people who have money out there. So some of the items that you might find are probably nicer than like some you know lower income places in in Canada in general. But uh, yeah, I'd be interested to know what you think for pros and cons. Yeah, I think that that might be true. There are a lot of wealthy people here. Um, I can tell you a funny story about the kinds of things that happened to us. I mean, there was there was this house in a super rich neighborhood on the west side that we always used to drive by, like taking our dog to the park. And one day there was like a trash bin outside of this house. And my husband's always like, What's going on? What's that? Like? And so he's watching this trash bin. He drove by it a bunch of times. And one day the trash bin was open and there was somebody there and he just decided to stop and chat with them. And um, they had a couple interactions. Then the house was sold. Then he went back another time and there was someone else there. And he was like, oh, did everything get given away? And the guy's like, yeah, there's still some stuff around. Take whatever you want. I don't even care. Guy did not care. And he goes in, in the garden. And he finds this pot and it's like a Chinese like pot. You know, it had just been stuck in the garden. So most people would just mistake it as a garden piece, a planter or something like that. But mm -hmm. he's looking at it and like we have a pretty good eye for stuff. And he thought this seems old, but at the very least, someone will pay 60 bucks for it. It's a cool planter. And we look at it, we do some research and I, I ran it by a whole bunch of, um, I mean, several Chinese and Japanese like ceramics collecting groups because we get a lot of this kind of stuff. And uh, multiple people agreed that this was from the late 1500s and this was an urn that used to have a lid but it didn't have the lid anymore okay and we were like this thing's 400 and some years old like what and i ended up putting that up on ebay and i think i i think i sold it for about 400 dollars, which we were thrilled about because it was just in the garden it was probably yeah. worth four thousand or i don't know even more but it is the kind of thing that you come across here i mean it's amazing what people will just put out as trash that ends up being worth hundreds of dollars or more all of my jewelry that I wear, I call it my garbage gold because it was literally all destined for the landfill before I had it, <laughs> like everything I own. Um, so I think that is one interesting thing about being here. Uh, another great thing about being in Vancouver is being so close to the border because actually our best sourcing is in the US. Okay. Uh, we can, yeah, we can cross the border to a farm in Linden for an estate sale and absolutely pack our truck for three or $400 and come back with eight, $9,000 worth of merchandise. It's you know, it's a great day. And so that's another thing that makes it so great about living in a wealthy border town is, you know, you have access to some pretty amazing stuff just right over there. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm I'm in a, in a place in Ontario that I'm, I'm about two hours from Michigan. So like Detroit area, and then another two hours in the other direction would be like Buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never considered like I've went to thrift stores when we just crossed the border for like the day. Yeah, I've never considered actually going over there. So when you bring that back across the border, is the is are they like, how do you deal with customs at that point? They they probably don't care because it's used or uh yeah, it depends. So the rule is it's it is technically an import. Mm -hmm. So you have to have your RMA, what I think that's what it's called, RMA import export number. It's just okay. a little tag at the end of your business number. It's free. Um, yep. anybody can get that. And so you have we have that. So when we go across, we're always very transparent about what, what we do. We come back. What did you buy? A truck full of junk. Want to see? 
<laughs> and they're like, wait, what do you mean? Like, what kind of junk is always how the conversation goes? Oh, well, this time we got a bunch of die cast cars and like some farming equipment. Um, uh, I don't know, some quack medical stuff. Like, do you want to see it? And they're like, no. Well, how much did you pay? Uh, 400 bucks. Do you have a receipt? Kind of. I got one from this one place, but the other one did go. And nice. <laughs> most of the time they say like, what do you, sometimes they ask what you're going to do with it. And of course we're, we're going to resell it. And nobody has ever asked for the RMA number, but it is, you have to have it in case okay. they do. And what twice they've asked us to come in and pay the GST, but it's up to their discretion to do that or not. Um, but it's, it's totally legal. So. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I actually do have that number because with, I use a cross border shipping company. Mm -hmm. And to get my returns back from the States, I had to have that number because it's considered right. an import, <laughs> import or whatever. Because, um, yeah, I was like, when I first started using it, I'm like, why are they just sitting here? And I and I called them like, oh, you have to have this number. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh. So, yeah, that is interesting. Um, yeah, that might be something that, that I would consider doing in the future just even for fun. Um, but uh, what else would you go over to the U.S. for? Do you? So you're not really actively thrifting, uh, right? Like mm -hmm. you guys pretty much that's this is your sourcing right you're not really garage sailing you're not doing any of the, the any you know maybe for fun you could garage sailing but we do we do yeah. lots of garage sailing uh, my husband loves it especially he uh, every saturday morning he's going and i never i hardly ever go but in in the us it's very different garage sales there are, are really lucrative um they're usually really big americans have so much stuff um and generally pretty cheap uh, we have never gone to the U.S. on a road trip and not come back with enough stuff to pay for our entire trip and then some. It's uh, it's really a lot of fun. <laughs> I really I love going down there for sourcing. And we get some such interesting stuff that you just don't find in Canada, like all that yeah. Americana stuff. Not all of it made it up here. So it's uh, it's definitely exciting to source like all kinds of different kinds of stuff that you'd never find in B.C. I know we talked a little bit before we uh, started this recording about like some bolos and stuff. So it's a little bit different because you're not sourcing conventionally. Like I think I'll, maybe a lot of people in this niche would be doing, but what do you think some bolos, what are things you are looking for or you would set aside instantly when, you, when you're looking to declutter a house or to go through everything in the house? Sure. I mean, our biggest are actually our biggest sellers are comic books and die cast cars, but those are categories you can't really call bolo because 98% of them are junk and you have to know exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a few interesting, more unusual things that I thought of when you asked that question, one was um, Canto Pop, which if you don't know what that is, it's like Cantonese uh, pop music from the 90s and okay. 2000s. <laughs> so that's something that you find a lot of here and it goes in the trash all the time. Uh, CDs, vinyl records or cassettes does not matter the type of media. Um, this stuff is extremely popular. Um, it's a challenge to list it because you have to Google Translate everything to try and get the names and stuff. But um, it's plentiful, it's cheap or super free, and it and it can sell very well. We we got and not just not just pop music, but also some classical like Chinese opera and stuff. I remember we got a whole bunch of uh, Chinese opera music vinyl in a lot once, and we posted one that we thought was pretty unusual. We posted it for a thousand dollars, and it sold while we were asleep, and we were like what wow. <laughs> what did we do so that's a good one that's a big one um we love lanterns coleman lanterns that's a great that's a great bolo you can often pick those up for five or ten bucks and the rare ones will sell for quite a bit of money um they're fun and they're aesthetically cool so i really like to pick them up another one would be um this is kind of a broader category but like older electrical testing equipment Okay. Specifically a brand called Heathkit, but there's other brands that are really good. Um, multimeters and things like that. I don't really know what they do, but I recognize them when I see them. They're usually really cheap because no one knows what they do. And um, the people who do know what they do will pay quite a bit for them. So that's something oh, we sure. always look for. Um, yeah. So that's one. Um, another one would be license plates. Okay. Yeah, this is a fun category. Um, it's a very niche collectible, um, a, a very obsessed group of collectors who love license plates for all different reasons. Not a lot of people realize that this is a collectible category. Um, they can be trashed, they can be dented, they can be dirty, it doesn't matter. Old license plates are a great seller. And it doesn't, they obviously like the porcelain ones from the 19s are the absolute best, but you know, any decade, any era, people are looking for like their initials 
from every okay. state or like whatever the, the reason is. So you can pick up any plate and always get 20 bucks for it. Like always. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I love getting license plates. We actually picked up, there was an estate, you know, talking about people getting rid of stuff from multi-million dollar homes. This, these brothers were just emptying out a house one day and we went to pick up a, a wooden chest that they were giving away. Saw a license plate sticking out of a box and said, what are you guys doing with that? And they're like, oh, throwing it away. There's four more boxes. Do you want them? We're like, really? <laughs> and he just gave them to us. And we said, like, we are going to sell these on eBay. Um, do you want some money for them? And they're like, no, we're just going to get rid of them. And it was probably $10,000 worth of inventory. Anyway. Wow. <laughs> yeah, just for free. Uh, yeah. Because they're going to sell the house for $7 million. They don't care. Right. And the fifth one is digital, compact digital cameras, which I think more and more people are learning about now. But you can pick them up at yard sales for 2 bucks, 5 bucks, And I still haven't quite figured out how to recognize the more valuable ones. But I find on the low end 25 or 30 dollars if they're working and we've sold some upwards of two three hundred bucks for particularly desirable models yeah it's funny too i've i've definitely got into that a little bit with the cameras and you look up the you look up the model and you're like it's like a seven megapixel camera it looks like garbage and it's worth like a hundred dollars for some reason why <laughs> yeah i don't know i i really don't um I can understand with some of the ones that were like popular for like vlogging back in like the early 2000s or something. But even then, the quality isn't that great. So I'm not really sure what, why people like them, but they are seem to be making a comeback for sure. Yeah, they're lots of fun. And um, I don't know, I just, I get a kick out of like picking them up for a toonie and going like, I wonder what this model, or I get one and I think, oh, for sure, this one's so cool. It's got to be worth $100. And I find out it's 30 and I'm like, I don't get it. So, um, so are you guys working, uh, do you have like an office that you're renting to? Or are you working from your home in some way or a little bit of both or... Uh, we have a warehouse. It's okay. uh, We lucked out. We Oh, man, dude, we got so lucky. About seven years ago, um, we found a warehouse space for rent about five minutes from where we live. And okay. it was a really good price. So we moved in there. Um, it was a leap at the time. We were nervous about taking on that much space. It's 2,000 mm -hmm. square feet. Now we're bursting out of it like it's not okay. nearly big enough. Um, so we do almost everything uh, out of there. I obviously do like a lot of work from home as well. But um, but yeah, all of the all the magic happens down at the warehouse. Yeah, work from home doesn't surprise me. It seems like when you get into this sort of thing, uh, it's really hard to put down. There's a lots of days where I think like, oh, I'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna try to not worry about it. And then you get an email, you get a message, and before you know it, you're right back into it. But uh, I'm sure if you're if you're still doing this, like I absolutely still love this, which is I hope like I've talked about a few times in these this series. Like I certainly hope that feeling never goes away, where this truly starts to feel like a job. Have you hit that point over the twelve years where you're like? burnt out or just dreading it uh yeah we do experience burnout i mean we're yeah we're both in this all the time and when you you live with the same person you're working with you end up talking about work like yeah. always right and so you have to we have to consciously make time to do other things or we do get we kind of get to the point where we're resisting going to work it's 10 30 we're still drinking coffee why haven't we gone to the warehouse yet it's like maybe it's time to take a few days off get out of town and that's the thing is we can't vacation here because we'll just end up working we have to yeah. leave vancouver um in order to completely separate ourselves and then of course what do you think my husband wants to do but go to every yard sale <laughs> on in a neighborhood of wherever we're vacationing <laughs> yeah, i mean that sounds like fun to me <laughs> <laughs> it honestly is really fun um so yeah we we do have to uh, consciously make time to step away from the business at least a couple of days here and there take our proper weekends you know go for walks in the forest and and stuff like that um to kind of keep that burnout but i mean but right now we're really motivated because we have a huge sourcing opportunity that we just got started on it's pretty much unlimited and we're just kind of trying to figure out the system to make it work and it's so exciting like we're just getting like crazy stuff every single day and it's like Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> so we're excited to go to work right now that's awesome yeah that's definitely something i'm trying to look for is just more um maybe some more bulk buys or consistent consistent inventory right now i'm relying heavily especially this time of year heavily on the goodwill bins which i don't know if you have one in your area or if you've ever been to yeah. one before um Everything is cheap, but, and, and occasionally you do find that one thing that is worth a couple hundred dollars or whatever. That's really like fantastic. But for the most part, I would say the stuff you, I pull out of there is like, you know, you're paying like a dollar or less for something that might be worth 
20 or 30 dollars which is fine it's yeah there's nothing wrong with it it's just hard to get excited about and it's and it's a grind like if you're selling items that are 20 or 30 dollars it takes a long time for that to really add up to be you know some significant money really um yeah i'm working on getting rid of everything in our store that's under 25 dollars. i don't even want to do it anymore um it'll still happen because when you buy like when you buy 500 comic books some of them are 20 dollar comic books and you just process them all but uh but yeah we try to we try to focus on those those higher value value items when we can and, and bulk buys are wonderful because you're getting a whole bunch of the same thing so then you just get more efficient with how you're processing it and then that helps you build your store faster for the same effort um so that's why i don't thrift yeah do you find yourself lighting up some of the like cheaper items just to make a better you know better buck on on stuff like that or you don't even bother you just discard cheaper items he says it depends on how much inventory we're getting in. But yeah, lots are a great way to go. Every once in a while, um, just to get uh, our people excited about stuff, we do like a $100 listing challenge where everything we process has to be worth at least 100 bucks. So when we're doing something like that, we, we're like, okay, comic books, all right, well, we have to put 15 comic books in the slot to make $100. And, and we just do that. And then we have like a little thing on the board where we check off like, we've never actually gotten to our uh, listing goal with a hundred for our hundred dollar listing challenge, but it is a good way to kind of speed things up and get some higher value items out there on the on the market. Yeah, so co comic books are kind of interesting. How far down like the rabbit hole have you went with like grading like high quality ones, or do you not even deal with like grading, or do you just kind of go with the best money you could possibly get without going down and doing that? We've only done a CGC submission one, and we were fairly happy with how it went um we made money on it but uh, i think in the end it just wasn't something that we really enjoyed right. and i'm kind of happy sometimes to pass that on to the buyer who wants to extract the value out of it if collecting graded books is something that they enjoy mm -hmm. great um we did it it was fine it was profitable but we were kind of like eh, it's just extra work so yeah. for the most part we sell our comic books raw kind of prefer it that way but we'll buy collections of graded comic books yeah well, for sure why not that that makes the most sense yeah. it's time consuming too i don't think people realize how long it takes to get stuff back when you send it out yep yeah. uh last time we did it was six months yeah that's, <laughs> that's unreal and it's not and it's i mean it's still going to cost you like like just the, the average person who doesn't maybe understand kind of maybe just let them know how how the process works like how much money were you into it do you think when you did send it out so I have no idea what we paid for the comic books um, okay. because we buy them in such huge quantities that I can't even tell you. It, if I were to break it down, it would be like 10, 50 cents. Yeah, but you know, I, I don't know. Sure. So, <laughs> but um, so we don't have a lot, anything really invested into them when we send them out at, at a minimum grading is it might have gone up since I last looked. I think it was $25 for the absolute lowest tier. Mm -hmm. If your comic book is worth more, you have to pay more. They base their pricing on market value for higher value books and for older books um, you also pay more for speed you also have to pay for the shipping and the return shipping and the insurance and take the whole risk of sending it packaging it properly and hoping they package it right and yeah. send it back to you without it getting damaged so there's a lot of that I think we did 25 comics when or maybe no maybe it was 20 and I think it came out to around five or five five or six hundred US just the cost of everything uh, for those books to come back. And you just don't know if you're going to get that book that pays for it all. You know, it has to come yeah. back at the grade you're expecting. And if it doesn't, then you might be out totally out that money because the comic book that comes back graded an 8.5 when you think it's going to be a 9.6 is like 20% of the value. So you might as just, just wasted your money. Yeah. And I honestly think that's probably surprising to the average person who thinks it's just send it away spend a few bucks and get it back graded it's it's quite a process and you'd pay every step of the way and like you said when you do actually have something that's more valuable it's going to cost you more, more money in the end as well um so when you did get going here and reselling you probably made some mistakes like we all do i, I mean i think we all still make mistakes along the way but uh what's something that you wish you would have knew when you get started that really would you know would have helped you out oh every day <laughs> uh, you know it's not I, I never go back and say, oh, I wish I knew this or I wish I or I regret this because I feel like the whole process of entrepreneurship is just 
is just diving in and figuring it out. So I don't really have any regrets. I guess it, I guess one thing I wish I had done when we first started, I wish I had focused more on building our company as a brand. I mean, it was always my goal to scale up to where we are and, and hopefully we'll get to way, way beyond where we are. But I always thought like, it'd be so cool to turn reset, like my reselling company into a brand because there's not very many, um, there's not very many people who've done that. There's YouTubers who've successfully branded themselves and done a great job. And then there's value village. And in between that, you don't have a lot, um, at least not in the online selling space. Right. So I kind of wish I'd had the confidence to go in and say, this is something I know I can do and I can own it. Um, I feel like the only the last couple of years have I really been leaning into the idea of building the storage warrior brand. And uh, I think if I had maybe done that, like before the pandemic, we'd probably be in a different place. But again, no, no regrets. I still love what I do every single day. Yeah. And I mean, as far as your presence online, if anybody, I'll link all your stuff down below, down below. I mean, your content is very quality. Uh, when you Thank start you. looking through your website, it's very professional. Um, so you do come off very, like very well, like as far as that goes. So, I mean, that's a big, uh, you know, competent com compliment to you personally, maybe, but like, I think to your business as well, it definitely, when you kind of research, you are, you instantly look very professional. It doesn't look just like something that's been slapped together. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Which is unclear what you, what you want to hear, but I mean, that is the absolute truth. And if it, and if it wasn't, I would, I would tell you, tell you, you know, maybe in, in a kinder way that it wasn't, but no, <laughs> it, it really is. And I, I will link everything down below. So for people who don't, don't know, you know, your story or your, your products, definitely take a look. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it was quite a bit that I invested into the brand a couple of years ago and then, and then just, I had that and then, but it was still really hard to get it, get it going and make it noticeable just because of honestly, because of COVID, because I couldn't get out there and do networking events in person, which is what I'm really good at. Yeah. Uh, and now that we can finally do that again, it's kind of, you know, we're starting to gain some momentum. So it's a whole other side of reselling that is really fun for me. So I love both aspects of it. Definitely check out the description down below. We'll have everything linked for Jess and the Storage Warriors uh, YouTube channel and the podcast and everything. Thanks once again. I really do appreciate your time. Hope to do more of these in the future. Uh, and, you know, till next time, guys, take care. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.